Hi, my name is Donna Brendel, and I'm the host of I Should Say That Out Loud. How does autism manifest in my daily life? Guess what? I am going to unpack that thought out of this little trunk here. I've written down lots of ways that autism manifests in my life on a daily basis, and I'm going to pull them out of this trunk and unpack them and talk to you about them one by one. I didn't used to talk very much, and I still am quiet in new environments and new situations and with, especially with new people involved. Um, When I started my new job last year, my boss was pretty verbal about letting me know how quiet I was all the time and how uncomfortable it made him. And I hadn't told him yet about my autism, Um, but... I was, it was a new job, a new environment, all new people, and I just couldn't find words to even in small talk to share with people until I got to know them, until I got to know the environment, until I got to know the job. And I'm much more talkative to the people that I work with on a daily basis now, um, and a little more talkative to my boss that I see less often. And now I've told him about my autism and that's helping him understand my quietness and that's helping me to talk more because we're, I'm more open about it and we're able to have this conversation back and forth about it. So I've, I've grown in my ability to verbalize and talk and recognize how I feel in my body and put words to it and realize I should say that out loud so the other people in the room know how I feel so that we can have communication and especially for relationships so we can grow in our relationship and understand each other better. Um, I have missed a lot of social cues when I was, well, I still do, but especially when I talked less when I was younger because a lot of these social cues and social rules are not written anywhere. Nobody teaches them in school. And it's just somehow people just know them. I read a book a few years ago when I first was diagnosed and I lost the copy or I lent it to somebody. So I don't have it to quote and to read to you, but she made a really great list, an actual list of all the social rules that aren't written anywhere. She wrote them down so that people with autism can use this list to educate ourselves and to learn about all these social norms and social rules that somehow are just known by most people, but are unknown for whatever reason by people with autism. So I remember once I was just going to my friend's house to have a play date. We didn't call it play dates back then, but I was going to my friend's house to play. (laughs) And I knocked on the door and her mom came to the door and she stood like her with her back to the one side of the door frame and her arm up touching the other side of the door frame and her leg stretched across touching the bottom of the other side of the door frame so essentially she was blocking the whole doorway as a clue Donna don't come in our house for whatever reason I don't know why but I did not catch that clue at all. I don't know if it was because they didn't like me anymore or because the family was busy or they were having an argument. I have no idea why she was doing that, but I missed it. My twin sister was with me. She was behind me and she saw the clue and she realized, oh, we can't play today. We need to leave. And she was about to leave, but I walked through this mom's arm and leg and I like climbed through her and over her to get into her house and I just let myself in and she was looking at me like what are you doing and I I remember the look but I didn't compute it back then as to oh maybe I shouldn't come in or maybe we should just leave I just kept going in because we had been there a bunch of times before and we were friends and that was the norm that we could go over and play anytime (laughs) <laughs> and then after we finally left, I don't know how long we were there before she got across to me that we couldn't stay that day. We left and my sister said to me, 
why did you climb through her like that? What were you thinking? I'm like, what do you mean? And she pointed out, like, she was blocking the door. Didn't you see that? And then I'm like, well, yeah, her arm was up and her leg was, is that why she was blocking the door? Like, how did I miss that? I don't, but I clearly missed it. <laughs> okay, so I also did not get the social cues or clues or heads up on how to dress for social occasions. And this really lasted into my young adulthood and adulthood. Um, I went to a bridal shower for a friend when I was in my early 20s. And I got to the bridal shower and I was wearing jeans in a blue t-shirt. It was like a nicer t-shirt. Like it wasn't like a graphic t-shirt with a picture on it. It was just a solid blue t-shirt <laughs> and sneakers and just my hair straight and brushed, a tiny bit of makeup. And I get to the bridal shower and every single girl is wearing a dress, like a nice summer dress. And here are nice and then these nice gifts. I don't think I even had a gift, but I did notice that how different and out of place I was dressed for that occasion. I don't know if it's because I was in my 20s by then and my brain had grown and developed more because our brains do grow into our 20s until we're like 26 years old. And I was starting to put these things together and recognize these things. And I made a mental note to myself, bridal shower equals dress. <laughs> and then I started paying attention to all the other social events that I went to and watching what people were wearing. And then I would remember past events so that I could dress more properly for future events. And then I also was more particular when I was shopping for clothes to make sure I had a variety of summer dresses, nice dresses, casual dress dresses, nice pants, casual pants. So that when in a situation came, came up that I was invited to, I would have the proper attire. <laughs> I did not want to get caught in that situation again. And now I have probably too many clothes and I'm too prepared for any kind of outfit I might need. But I don't, I have a hard time downsizing these things because I don't want to be caught unprepared again. Is that an excuse to have a big wardrobe? Maybe. I do like clothes. It's not really a special interest, but I like thrift shopping. That's a special interest. <laughs> okay, I, found, I find it really hard to relax enough to enjoy a massage. If I go and get a massage, there's so many sounds in the room. Like there's the nice music that they play. And then there's the um, essential oil diffuser, that noise. And then there's the noise of the person getting the oils and lotions ready. And then there's the sound of her or him, um, like moving the blanket and doing the massage and walking around in the footsteps. So all those noises I hear and I'm trying to relax and not hear them, but I still hear them. And then there's the scents. I can smell the essential oil. I can smell the lotions. I can smell the, like the hole that they put on you sometimes is scented or just whatever it was washed in. You can smell the, the soap. And then if the person's talking on top of all of that, there's more noise. And then there's more that I have to think about and respond. And I know they tell you that you don't have to talk and you can be quiet. I could be quiet if I want to, but if they're talking to me, I have to respond. I don't want to be rude. And sometimes I can relax for like a moment or two and then another noise will happen or like the massage will be too, too har harsh or uh, on my fingers or toes that have neuropathy, it could be actually painful. <laughs> and, and then I'm like nervous that something else go is going to be painful. Um, even just the sound of the person's skin fingers on my skin, I can hear that. And it just totally distracts me and pulls me out of the relaxation mode of enjoying the massage to hearing the sounds and feeling the uncomfortable sensations. And it's not as enjoyable as it should be or could be, for sure. I know that. 
and and then there's myself reminding myself to relax <laughs> and that replays over and over and then i have to tell myself stop saying relax and just relax <laughs> Does that make sense <laughs> transitions take me a long time transitioning from leaving my house to go shopping and have my list and my the order of if I'm doing chores, I'm going to go here first and then there and then there. And then when I get to the store, actually gathering my purse or phone or whatever, gathering my things and getting out of the vehicle and going into the store takes me a minute. I, I don't just stop and put it in park and get out. I, it's just there's a transition that happens. And sometimes it's just a thought process. Maybe it's knowing that once I get into the store, I'm going to be overwhelmed and I'm going to forget what I'm there for. So I better have my li list, whether it's on a piece of paper or in my notes in my phone. And then when I get into the store, I oftentimes will forget what I'm there for, even if I reviewed it in the car before I got out. Even if it's only two or three things. I, I've In the past, I've told myself, I don't need a list. It's only two or three things. Then I get to the store. And I walk in and I for, totally forget what I'm there for because there's so much to see. There's so many decisions to make that I get overwhelmed and I forget what I'm there for, even if it's two or three things. So now I bring a list no matter what. And as soon as I walk in the store, I have the feeling of, oh gosh, what am I here for? And then I remember I have the list. It's okay. Look at your list. So I'll look at my list and then decide which direction to go which part of the store, which aisle to go to, to get the things on my list. The only time I don't need a list is if I'm going grocery shopping for my lunch stuff, because I know it's the same, because I eat the same lunch every day, every week, for a whole year, for years, on and on. And that's another reason I like to eat the same things every day, because it's easy to shop. I can go in, get what I need, and leave. I don't have to browse and remember and <laughs> stress over all of that. And then packing my stuff into the car and leaving the store is another transition of kind of processing, did I get everything or I, I got too much or I got distracted and I bought stuff I didn't need. And just thinking through that, those thoughts before I start driving and, and head home. A lot of times I can't think those thoughts in the moment. And when I get to the next moment is when I'm able to be removed from the previous situation and my brain can process the previous situation. I don't know why I can't process things in the moment as well as once I'm removed from the moment, then I'm able to process that situation and that event better. I don't know if it's being removed from the situation or the time gap, or maybe it's a combination of both. I enjoy routines. I have daily routines that I do, like skincare and taking vitamins and stretching in bed when I wake up before I get out of bed. But things that I, things that I do very routinely on an everyday basis, I can forget completely to do if I go on vacation or if I visit family and I'm in a different bed or a different room or a different place. Even though it's such a routine that I've done for years, I can still forget it because now I'm in a different environment and my brain is overwhelmed and just, it's all different. And then if I'm there long enough, I can remember, oh my gosh, why am I totally forgetting my routine? Then I can start to implement the routine again. And by the time the vacation ends or the visit ends is when I'm starting to remember what I'm supposed to do. And then I get back home again and then it's, it comes back like it never left. <laughs> I am terrible at keeping up with email. Email is my nemesis, like number one nemesis. I don't like email. <laughs> it's necessary and I try my best, but if I don't get back to you right away in an email, send me another one or better yet, call me or text me and ask me your question in that form, or ask me to look at the email that you sent um, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so here's another big word that I've learned 
since I've been learning more about autism. It's echolalia or echolalia. Not sure which way it's pronounced. Most people who experience this say certain words and phrases out loud over and over again, or just repeat, they repeat what somebody else says out loud. And they might say it once repeating somebody, or they might say it several times repeating somebody, or they might just repeat themselves in saying a certain word or phrase. For me, I do that, but I do it in my mind. I do it silently. And I also practice it or say it, especially if it's a multiple word phrase, I'll say it over and over again with emphasis on a different word each time to decide which way it sounds best. And if I actually had to say it out loud, which way would I say it out loud? Which emphasis would be the best way to use that phrase? And usually it's a silly practice because I'm not going to say it out loud anyway. <laughs> so just like a simple, a simple phrase like the sky is bright today. Um, the sky is a pretty blue today. The sky is a pretty blue today. Or the sky is a pretty blue today. The skies are pretty blue today. The skies are pretty blue today. <laughs> Who cares? It really doesn't matter. But my brain likes to hear the sentence with the emphasis on each different word each time to see which one sounds better. And in my my brain is the judge of which one's better. Like <laughs> nobody cares. I don't even care, but my brain cares. My brain wants to hear it, so something I do. I have this thing that I do with my fingers. Um, it's kind of a fidget, but it's really more of a stress, a stress reducer, or I do it when I'm stressed, especially if I'm watching a scary show or a scary movie or like a intense news cast. Um, and I'll rub my fingers on my thumb cuticles, sometimes on the thumbnails, but mostly on the cuticles, and never up, never from the end up, always from the upper part down to the outside. You don't want to go upriver <laughs> with your cuticles. That ugh. I never thought about that till just now. <laughs> do it down um and I don't go back and forth because then that would be again up river and I don't do it up river <laughs> now I'm cracking myself up <laughs> so I will do that with my thumbs and then sometimes I'll use my thumbs on my forefingers and if it's really stressful I'll go all the way to my other fingers into my pinky and then back to my thumbs again. Like I'm feeling stressed out right now just doing it and like a, it's comforting all of a sudden to, to do that. But anyway, um, or I might do this and feel, um, you know, that your finger tip, your finger um, print has that little middle piece that's kind of raised. <laughs> I like to feel that and like push, push on it. Um, and sometimes I have a callus there. And just so all these things I do with my fingertips. And it really stresses out my daughter, so I try not to do it when I'm around her. But then when I can't do it, it gives me more stress. Even though a lot of times I don't even realize I'm doing it until she asks me to stop doing it. Then I'm like, oh, now I really need to do that. <laughs> um, I have a lot of fidgets, too. Like, I'll fidget with a pen at work all the time. I'll take the cap off and put it back on again. And I try to do it as quietly as I can, even though it's not loud. I still try to, I don't know, find a technique, a way that seems to me like it's quieter. <laughs> um, and then twisting the cap or just barely putting it on and then see if it'll fall off or not. <laughs> um, so I can find a way to fidget with pretty much anything. So if there's not an actual fidget, fidget thingamabobber, like one of these things that I like, then I can find anything to fidget with. Even my clothes, like the um, 
the hem off my clothes. I'll might maybe roll it or straighten it. <laughs> um, and that brings me to my last one is adjusting my clothes. And I, again, I like symmetry. I like things to be centered and balanced. And so sometimes my bra feels like it gets off centered and I have to fix it. And I don't want to like visibly fix my bra where people can see me doing that. So I'll just like tap my bra with my elbow or my inner arm and fix it. But that's obvious to people too, probably, but less obvious than me using my hands. <laughs> but I do that a lot. And sometimes it probably doesn't even need to be adjusted because it's really not off center, but it becomes such a habitual thing for me to do that I'll find myself doing it anyway. Um, and then if I'm sitting, sitting still for a long time, especially if my back is into the chair, like right now I'm sitting forward, but if my back is into the chair, like if I'm at church or in the car and my back is rubbing the back of the chair, then I have to adjust my shoulder blades and my bra strap and stretch and <laughs> I just adjust a lot if I'm having to sit for a long period of time, especially if all of my body is contacting the chair. And maybe I'll just lean forward and pull away from the chair, stretch out a little bit and relieve myself of that sensation of my back on the chair. Oh, so with that, I've emptied my trunk and unpacked how autism manifests itself in my daily life. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed that trip through my trunk of autism things that I do and experience. I'm sure that's not even an exhaustive list and there's more things that I've missed. Please let me know if you have any questions or thoughts about these things, if you relate to any of these things that I shared. If you'd like to know more about any of these specific areas that I experience, and if I can explain them a little bit better. So thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to my channel and like this episode and share it with a friend. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.